Greetings to all of you. My dear sisters and brothers and my dear friends, a warm welcome to all of you from your pastor Yeti. On earth as it is in heaven, how the Lord's Prayer teaches us to pray. And today we are in the last part of our Father, the benediction for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. For centuries, Christians, Christian congregations praying the Lord's Prayer have concluded with this benediction, and it is a fitting way to end such a wonderful prayer. Without it, our praying would be with the Father and with the evil, I mean the devil. We would be moving from heaven to hell in a very short time, and that kind of liturgy is far from edifying. The benediction enables us to begin with the Lord, continue with the Lord, and end with the Lord. However, scholars tell us that this benediction is not part of the original text and that it was probably added when churches began to pray the Lord's Prayer together in public worship. In the Didache, a 2nd century local church manual, it reads, for time is the power and the glory forever. Other manuscripts of Matthew's Gospel have different versions or no benediction at all. Just because this benediction is not part of the original text doesn't mean that using it is a sin or that the benediction itself teaches heresy. It's generally agreed that the benediction is based on the words of David in 1 Chronicles 29 when he commissioned, uh, commissioned his son Solomon to build the temple. Praise be to you, Lord, the God of our Father Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. Yours, Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the majesty and the splendor for everything in heaven and earth is yours. Yours, Lord, is the kingdom. You are exalted as head over all. Wealth and honor come from you. You are the ruler of all things. In your hands are strength and power to exalt and to give strength to all. Now, our God, we give you thanks and praise. Your glorious name. 1 Chronicles 29 verses 10 to 13. Isn't that powerful and so beautiful? This is the kingdom and the power and the glory are found here in David's magnificent expression of worship, as well as the phrase from everlasting to everlasting. It's like that the benediction in Matthew 6.13 was born out of this womb of inspired scripture and therefore may be used by God's people today. The statement, the kingdom and the power and the glory forever is a poetical way of saying your powerful glorious eternal kingdom and it reminds us that our heavenly father is wonderful beyond description we can pray to him and praise him from grateful hearts because prayer and praise go together we open the lord's prayer with hallowed be your name and we close it with for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever True worship involves praise wrapped in prayer. That's the way to keep our praying from being selfish. The benediction begins with the word for, which suggests that it is an arrangement for this prayer and a defense of praying itself. It says to us, prayer is reasonable. Why should we ask for these blessings? Because our God has will to give them to those who ask, and he is able to do what he wills. If he is king, he has power, and he reveals his glory to us by answering prayer. Satan wants to convince us that prayer is a waste of time. But the word of God 
and our own Christian experience assures us that prayer is the key to God's treasury of grace. The Lord's Prayer reveals to us what our God is like, and this should encourage us to pray. He is a Father who loves us and a King who reigns in heaven and works on earth. He provides our daily needs and forgives our sins. He guides us as we do His will and protects and delivers us when the enemy attacks. Why should we worry or be afraid? But the prayer not only reveals truth about God, it reveals truth about God's children. We are part of a glorious family, our Father, that transcends time and space and one day will be gathered in heaven. Our sins are forgiven and we have the blessing, hope of sharing in Christ's promised kingdom. We depend on our Father to feed us and to lead us as we seek His will and obey it. Praying this prayer should remind us of our own needs, not our greeds, and our Father's gracious provision. Above all else, it reminds us that all the glory, glory belongs to God, and that we should never ask the Father for anything that does not glorify Him. The phrase, yours is the kingdom, acknowledge that the Lord is in control and we must yield to His will. The command, be still and know that I am God, Psalm 46, verse 10, literally means, take your hands off and relax. We are too prone to tell the Father what to do and to start manipulating circumstances to soothe ourselves. When we should submit to Him because the kingdom is His, at times we walk by sight and wonder if God is at work at all. With this posture is both foolish and dangerous. Imagine how disturbed Mary and Martha were when Jesus delayed arriving at Bethany when their brother Lazarus was so sick. Our Lord waited so long that Lazarus died. But when Jesus raised him from the dead, it brought more glory to God than if he had simply healed him. And many people trusted Christ as a result. We must not minimize the phrase and the power for there are kings and queens who reign but cannot rule because they have no power or authority. They are primarily figureheads, symbols of an ancient kingdom that helps to glue things together. Our God is not like that. The angel Gabriel proclaimed to Mary, for no word from God will ever fail. Luke 1 verse 37 And Jesus himself told his disciples that all things are possible with God. He is, he has power. We see evidence of it in the world around us as well as in the functioning of our own bodies. The word records what God did through the lives of believing people. Hebrews 11 is a good example and challenging us to trust Him to do in and through us that which will glorify Him. Very truly I tell you, said Jesus, all who have faith in me will do the works I have been doing, and they will do even greater things than these, because I am going to the Father, and I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. What an encouragement to people who pray. Let's be careful not to limit the demonstration of God's power, the physical healing, or the provision of material needs, because we need His power for overcoming the enemy, building character, and using our gifts and ability to accomplish His will on earth. Jesus told us that no matter how hard we try, apart from Him, we can do nothing.
from writing a letter to preaching a sermon to performing an appendectomy. Believers need the power of God. Only through the power of God will our ministry bring glory to God. As Paul extols in Ephesians 3 verses 20 to 21. Now to him. Who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. That brings us to the next part of our benediction. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory. The scriptures emphasizes the fact that humanity is sinful and fragile and has no lasting glory. All people are like grass. And all human faithfulness is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fall. Because the breath of the Lord blows on them. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of our God endures forever. Isaiah 40, verses 6 to 8. The kingdom belongs to God. The power belongs to God. And all the glory belongs to God. But everyone who has trusted Jesus Christ also belong to God. Our Father wants to use our witness to bring others into the kingdom, to introduce them to the power of God that can change lives. Ephesians 3 verse 20 points out that God's power works in us, ordinary people, and not just in the apostles. No doubt you have noticed that some television advertising includes a small line that reads, This is a paid endorsement. Our witness of Christ is a paid endorsement because we have been bought with a price, the blood of Jesus Christ. In fact, the price is a part of our witness. God's power is available to us if we truly seek to do His will and glorify His name. There is an awesomeness about the word forever. The kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Even though we often pray about material and physical things that don't last forever, we are still dealing with the things of eternity that do last forever. Our prayers involve the will and the glory of our eternal God, and they are marked forever. God is the eternal King, and His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. Prayer is not a waste of time. It is the best way to gain victory over time and invest in eternity. God has set eternity in the human hearts, which helps to explain why unsafe people are dissatisfied with life as they see family members and friends die and as familiar landmarks crumble and organizations come and go. They grave permanence, but there is none. There can be no satisfaction or peace except in Jesus Christ, the eternal Son of God. In Jesus we have eternal life, which is not simply endless life. For lost souls in hell will exist endlessly. No eternal life is the very life of God that is imparted to us when we trust Christ. While hell is an endless death. Heaven is the experience of God's life forever. Possessing eternal life on earth now means living days of heaven upon earth. Defining eternity is hard enough. Comprehending it is even more difficult. Time out of mind. Time out of mind, says one dictionary. And another says duration of time without beginning or ending. Because God is eternal. He had no beginning and will have no ending. God dwells in eternity. But time 
dwells in him. We are a part of eternity because we have received eternal life. God's life through faith in Jesus Christ. Eternal life dwells in us. And the Holy Spirit gives us a foretaste of heaven as we yield to him. The Christian life is built on the eternal. The eternal God is our refuge and we rest on his eternal word. We will share in eternal glory that far outweighs the burdens we carry today. Each child of God will have a glorious new body, an eternal house in heaven. We have an eternal inheritance that can never fade away. All the blessings and much more are ours because we possess eternal life in Jesus Christ. Consider the word forever. We will enjoy God's house, heaven forever. God's love endures forever. He is faithful forever. If we have been faithful, we will receive a crown that will last forever. Through Jesus Christ, we have been made perfect forever. God's word stands forever. Interestingly, in the New Testament, epistle, the word Amen is linked with the words glory and forever a number of times. In Romans 11, 36, Galatians 1, verse 5, Ephesians 3, verse 21, and there are so many other scriptures. Read these verses and meditate on them. As you do, rejoice in the fact that God's people are a part of eternity and will enjoy it. Forever. C.S. Lewis wrote in The Four Loves, All that is not eternal is eternally out of date. We Christians are often called old fashioned, or not with it, or outdated by people who don't know Christ, when actually it is our accusers who are out of date, because we share in God's eternal life. The passage of time takes nothing away from us that really is essential, and therefore we do not lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen, since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal, like the heart reacts of old. We live above the perishable by focusing on the eternal. Aim at heaven, wrote C.S. Lewis, and you will get earth thrown in. Aim at earth, and you will get neither. There are three words that Christian people throughout this world understand and use. Jesus, Savior, Hallelujah, praise the Lord, and Amen. May it be so, or may it come true. Since Old Testament days, God's people have used the word Amen as a response of faith and confidence to prayers, sermons, testimonies, and even songs. At Mount Abel, where Moses led the nation of Israel in accepting God's covenant, they responded by saying Amen to each blessing or curse. Paul used Amen five times as he wrote this letter to the Romans. And the Apostle John wrote Amen eight times in the book of Revelation. Those verses are worth studying. In the early church, it was expected that worshippers would be led by the Spirit to praise God and say Amen, as they understood the word being shared. Saying Amen in a service can be overdone. A well-known Bible teacher now in heaven was teaching at a conference and a man sitting in the balcony kept shouting Amen in response to almost every sentence the speaker uttered. The preacher, wearied of these distractions and interruptions, looked up at the man and said, My brother, the Holy Spirit is a dove, not a hood owl. That solved the problem. However, our problem today is just the opposite. 
too many worshippers remain silent when they ought to express their faith more enthusiastically without becoming hood owls. Over the centuries, Christian congregations have prayed the Lord's Prayer together and ended with in united Amen. The word itself comes from the Hebrew and means to lean on something strong to steady yourself. The image is one of a pilgrim leaning on a staff or a person being protected and held up by a friend. Amen is related to words like belief, trust, faithful, certain, reliable. When we say amen to a preacher's statement, we're saying, let it be so. We're committing ourselves to the truth we just heard and want others to join us in this commitment. The first occurrence of Amen in the Bible is in Genesis 15, verse 6. Abram believed the Lord, and he credited to him as righteousness. Literally, the verse says, Abram said, Amen to the Lord. The Amen was his faith response to the promises of God in verses 1 to 5. Abram was saying to the Lord, Let it be so. May it come true. He was affirming his confidence that God's promises were right and dispendable, and he didn't have to worry. A first cousin of the Hebrew word Amen is Emet, which means truth. He who is blessed in the earth will be blessed by the God of truth, and he who swears in the earth will swear by God of truth. In this verse, the Lord could be called the Lord of the Amen. To emphasize the statement, Jesus sometimes preferred it with verily, verily, or truly, truly. His words could very well be translated Amen, Amen. One of the names of Jesus is the Amen. Paul's words in 2 Corinthians verses 1 chapter 1 to 20 helps us understand and apply his name for no matter how many promises god has made they are yes in christ and so through him the amen is spoken by us to the glory of god the promises the father has given to his people he first gave to his son and the father will never violate his promises when by faith we say amen to a promise and claim it in the name of Jesus, that promise will be honored to the glory of God. As we abide in Christ, the Spirit shows us the promises in the word that we need. We claim these promises by faith when we say Amen. Through Jesus Christ, because Jesus is the Father's Amen to every promise that we need. The deeper we go into the scriptures, the better we get to know our Savior and the promises we have in him. Like Abraham, we must hear God's promise and say Amen to it as we claim it for ourselves. Jesus Christ is the Father's Amen to us and guarantees us each promise. It is also the Amen for us as he intercedes for us before the throne. But even more, Jesus is God's Amen in us through the Holy Spirit, teaching us assuring us and enabling us to say Amen to our Lord's yes in Christ. We enjoy all these privileges as we pray and fellowship with God. As unbelievable as it sounds, here on earth we are sharing in eternity. That's why the words kingdom, power, glory, forever and Amen are so important. They help us to take inventory so we can make sure we are on praying ground. Kingdom, am I a faithful child and servant of God? Power, am I depending on His power as I serve Him? Glory, is my motive only to glorify Jesus Christ? Forever, do I live with eternity's values in view? Amen. Am I walking by faith and saying Amen to His promises? If we can answer yes 
to the above questions, then we are privileged to share in eternity as we pray. Prayer is the soul's sincere desire, unuttered or expressed, the motion of an hidden fire that trembles in the breast. Prayer is the burden of a sigh, the falling of a tear, the upward glancing of an eye, when none but God is near. Prayer is the simplest form of speech that infant lips can try. Prayer, the sublimest strains that reach the majesty on high. Prayer is the Christian's vital breath, the Christian's native air, his wet word, his watchword at the gates of death. He enters heaven with prayer. Or you, by whom we come to God, the life, the truth, the way, the path of prayer, thyself has trod. Lord, teach us how to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. As we end together for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever amen may you find peace and rest in this benediction as we share together on earth as it is in heaven, how the Lord's Prayer teaches us to pray. Blessings to all of you, my dear ones. And this is the end of this study and meditations. Bye.